For tens of thousands of years, humans have known that the world around us is made of many different substances. All of these different substances tend to have different properties, such as reflecting light in a certain way, being a certain color, or being in a specific state of matter at a given temperature. Over time, people have also started to observe how these substances react with each other and intertwine or repel in certain circumstances. Here, we have a few images of some substances. We have sodium, palladium, and cobalt. In these images, the elements are all in their solidated form, but we also know that there are a lot of elements that are in a gaseous state when at room temperatures, such as oxygen, hydrogen, and helium. There are also several liquidous elements at standard room temperature. If we were to raise the temperature to very high amounts, these solidated elements would become liquids. However, if we put the sodium, palladium, and cobalt in a furnace, at 1600 degrees Celsius, by the time the palladium and cobalt became liquidous, the sodium will have already transformed into a gaseous state. This is because different elements have unique boiling and melting points. As we will be able to conclude from this example, sodium has a lower melting point and boiling point than palladium and cobalt. These are the basic relations that humans have been observing for thousands of years. This leads to a very fundamental question that with today's technology, we can answer much better than in the past. The question is that if we were to keep breaking the sodium into exponential smaller chunks, will there be a limit to how small we can divide it? Is there some smallest fragment or smallest unit of this substance that prohibits us from dividing any further? Or if we were to divide any further, the chunk would lose the properties of sodium. The answer to this question is that there is the smallest unit. As I've addressed, the sodium, palladium, and cobalt are all elements. They are just three of the 118 known elements, which are all represented on the periodic table of elements. In the table, we can see several different segments that provide different information for each element. Later on, I'll get into the details of what everything means. But as the basics, we can see that the number on the very top of each element's cubicle is their atomic number. The bolded one or two letters is the symbol of each element. Underneath that is the element's name. And at the very bottom is the element's atomic mass. Eventually, you will all familiarize yourselves with all 118 elements and their descriptions. For every single one of the elements you see here, their most basic unit and the answer to the aforementioned question is the atom. So if we were to keep dividing the sodium, you'd eventually get to a sodium atom. If you keep dividing the palladium, you would eventually get a palladium atom. And the same thing goes for the cobalt and the other 115 elements. Once you get to each of these elements atoms, you would not be able to break it down any further and still truthfully call it the dignified element and still have the element's properties. Something that pretty much everyone has a very tough time processing is that atoms are incomprehensibly small. For example, let's take a singular human hair. The width of a human hair usually ranges from 20 to 180 micrometers. If I were to ask you how many atoms you think span across the width of this hair, what would your answer be? You may have said a thousand or ten thousand, but in reality, a total of one million atoms span across the width of an individual human hair. This is obviously a rough approximation and not an exact one million, but this gives a good sense as to how incredibly small an atom really is. Another really interesting thing about all this is that every element has these basic units which are atoms, which we now know. But these atoms comprise of even more fundamental building blocks that make up each atom. These building blocks are so important that the definition of each atom is depicted by the arrangement of these particles. If you were to give or take a number of these building blocks to or from an atom, you could change its properties, reactions, and even the element of the atom itself. 
So what are these fundamental building blocks? There are three main building blocks that make up an atom. The first one is commonly known as the proton. The proton is actually what defines the atomic number of the atom. As shown earlier, the atomic number is the number on the very top of each cubicle of the periodic table of elements. The number of protons in an atom is its atomic number. As you may have figured out, the periodic table orders elements in order from least to greatest by atomic number. So this means that by definition, hydrogen, the first element on the periodic table, has one proton. Helium has two protons, lithium has three protons, and so on. This means that there is no lithium atom with four protons. If it did, it would not be a lithium atom, it would actually be a beryllium atom, since beryllium atoms have an atomic number of four, or four protons. So the proton is what defines the element. The other two building blocks of the atom are the electron and the neutron. Out of the three building blocks of the atom, you can try to somewhat compare the structure of the atom to a solar system. The protons and neutrons are bundled together in the center of the atom, known as the nucleus of the atom. You can conceptualize that this is metaphorically the sun of the solar system. In a carbon-12 atom, for example, there are certainly six protons, as that is what makes the atom a carbon, and we also have six neutrons. The number of neutrons and electrons can vary in an element, and the element would not change. But with protons, as I've mentioned, the element of the atom would change if the value of the protons is changed. So within the nucleus of a carbon-12 atom, you would have six protons and six neutrons. The reason it is called a carbon-12 is that there are a total of 12 protons and neutrons combined within the nucleus of the atom. In a different version of carbon, such as the carbon-13, there would still be six protons, as the element remains as carbon, but there would now be seven neutrons within the nucleus. Six plus seven equals 13 particles in the nucleus, and that is why the atom would be named carbon-13. The final building block of the atom is known as the electron. If we go back to our carbon-12 atom, we can assume that the atom is neutral, which is a term I will go into further depth later on the atom would have six electrons. The electrons are not a part of the nucleus. If we go back to our metaphor, the nucleus is our star, and so we can picture the electrons as our planets. However, we now have to ditch our astronomical metaphor after this stage. This is because while the orientation of the structure of the atom is similar to that of a solar system, electrons don't really orbit around the nucleus as planets do around a star. The electrons are closer to jumping around and buzzing around the nucleus. The reason that the electrons don't just fly off and away from the nucleus of the atom is because of each particle's electromagnetic charge. Protons have a positive charge, and electrons have a negative charge. One of the most fundamental principles with the electromagnetic force is that unlike charges attract each other. So the reason that electrons stick close to the nucleus of an atom is because they are attracted, attracted to the protons in the nucleus. Neutrons are neutral, but they also do affect the properties of some atoms of certain elements. If there were only protons in the nucleus, they would repel each other due to their identical electromagnetic charges. However, the neutrons force the protons to stay packed together and form the nucleus of an atom. The electrons actually have a really high velocity when jumping and buzzing around the nucleus, and so they don't want to simply fall into the nucleus and make contact with the positively charged protons. Something that forms a large amount of our understanding of chemistry is that electrons of a given atom can interact with the electrons of other atoms. They can actually be taken away by other and another atom. As a result, there are certain relations that the electrons of certain atoms have with certain others. We can start to predict the outcome of what will happen when an element is placed with another and what sort of bonds these atoms will form with one another. So with this in mind, a certain atom may have the ability to steal an electron from a carbon-12 per se. 
This is due to the fact that some elements have a larger affinity for electrons than others, which will cause the electrons to become more attracted to that atom. So after this sequence of events, the carbon-12 will be left with having fewer electrons than protons. This would mean that the atom would have a net positive charge, as there is now a greater amount of particles with a positive charge than there are with a negative charge. So these are the bare bones and the starting foundation on our journey through biology. A lot of these concepts will be gone into further detail in future videos, as this is already starting to get really interesting. So now that we've gone over this fundamental building block of elements known as the atom and its building blocks known as protons, neutrons, and electrons, we can now begin our deep dive into the field of biology. I also plan on doing future videos on other fields of science or other academics, but for now, I thank you all for watching.